Hello, and welcome to Dialogue Sunday Gospel Study. Today, April 11th, 2021, with Dr. David James Gonzalez. He will be drawing from sections 30 to 36 of the Doctrine and Covenants. I am Chris Kimball, conducting today on behalf of the Dialogue Foundation Board. Other board members, Michael Austin, Rebecca Deschwinitz, and Daylin Amasimaku are also part of our group today. Uh, we are using our webinar format on Zoom and running a live stream on Facebook, and it should be live now. We are recording this program. For viewers on Zoom, there's a chat and where you can comment, ask questions, and we will review and watch that chat. We'll also be watching comments on Facebook and try to introduce comments from both the chat and the Facebook when, when appropriate today. Um, for a lesson today, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. David James Gonzalez. Dr. Gonzalez is Assistant Professor of History at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. He teaches courses on race, race or ethnicity, on immigration and Latinas and Latinos in US history. His writing has been published in scholarly journals, anthologies and newspapers, including the Journal of American Ethics. I, I have American Ethics, well, that would be interesting. The Journal of American Ethnic History, American Studies, 50 Events That Shaped Latino History, and the Salt Lake Tribune. David James, or DJ, is also a co-producer and host of the podcast, New Books in Latino Studies, part of the New Books Network. We're excited to have Dr. Gonzalez with us today. And as always, I repeat our regular qualifier. We invite speakers for their personal insights, for their own voice. DJ speaks for himself today, not for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, not for BYU, and not for the Dialogue Foundation. Our program today will begin with music. Um, we're going to open with His Hands, performed in ASL by Susan Layton. And our opening prayer will be offered by Amanda Daniela Galan, a senior at BYU who is majoring in Latin American studies. Nuestro querido y amado Padre Celestial, te agradecemos infinitamente por las oportunidades que tenemos de uh, poder compartir el conocimiento de tu Evangelio juntos y de poder tener las Escrituras como nuestra guía. Te rogamos, Padre, que nos bendigas para que en este día podamos, um, el profesor González pueda tener el espíritu que necesita para hablar de temas referentes a ti y a tu Evangelio y para que todos podamos escuchar y poner en práctica las cosas que el Espíritu nos diga que vamos a hacer. Estas cosas las dejamos en el nombre de tu Hijo Jesucristo. Amén. Amén. DJ, you have the floor. Thank you, Amanda. Okay. <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you, Amanda. I have a lot of thank yous uh, to give uh, really briefly. Um, Amanda, it was a beautiful prayer. And um, thank you for accepting the invitation. Um, Amanda is one of a, my wonderful students. I claim her as my own, <laughs> although we all get to share her at BYU. Uh, so I thank her for, um, she's been among, um, you know, the several students that have really touched me and I've been able to learn so much from and, and really helped me to find community at BYU. So um, thank you. I also wanna thank the, um, the dialogue uh, board for the invitation. I want to uh, I want to thank you for the community that you have built um, throughout this pandemic. Uh, as I, I think of the pandemic and and all that's occurred <laughs> in this last year, as many say, it feels like it's been maybe ten years or so. Uh, but when I, I, I look at the blessings that have emerged out of the pandemic, this is one of my first thoughts. This is one of the first things that I go to, and um, I know it's taken a lot of work. Um, and, um, and so I, I appreciate that very much. And, and I want to connect what you've done, um, you know, with dialogue and, and with these Gospel Sunday lessons to, to our lesson today. Um, in essence, these chapters uh, are these sections in the Doctrine and Covenants and, and, and a few of the stories I'm going to highlight. They center on the process of conversion and, and people simply desiring what it is the Lord would have them do. That, that comes to them, you know, being called to share the gospel. Um, which is, in its essence, whether we want to call it preaching, sharing, it's inviting. We are inviting people to come to Christ. And that's exactly what uh, these study sessions ha have done. So thank you for that. I also just want to point out the, um, 
the beautiful song, um, His Hands. It's a, it's a, I, I probably first heard it on my mission uh, roughly 20 years or a little over 20 years ago now. Um, and I've been listening to it all week. So it's the uh, last couple of weeks, I think, just the Easter, um, you know, holiday and uh, this, you know, the entire Holy Week has just, um, you know, been a wonderful time to reflect and, and to have conference. And so that song has been um, on my mind a lot, particularly, you know, that last, that closing lyric. I am not yet as I would be. Uh, he has shown me how I could be. I will make my hands like those from Galilee. Again, to me, that, that crystallizes the message of this lesson. You know, when we think of uh, sharing the gospel, you know, um, it's, that's what it's all about. It's about bringing people to Christ. It's about helping them uh, experience the joy uh, that, uh, that, that we have felt. And um, so that is the essence of it. So thank you uh, again for that. Uh, let me also just point out that uh, as we go through the, the lesson, um, I, would, I already see the comments coming. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, again, we're going to be discussing mostly sections uh, 30 through 36, but I, I will be uh, really transparent. We're, we're primarily going to focus on sections 31, 33, and 34 uh, due to the examples that uh, there's three specific kind of stories that we can use to highlight here, uh, some of the messages. And um, so I hope that we can get to 28, 30, and 32, um, but uh, primarily we'll be focusing on 31, 33, and 34. So uh, definitely keep the comments coming and we'll, we'll try to include those as much as we can. Uh, to begin, I wanna think of, again, kind of where I, I began with, uh, you know, when we think of the call to uh, preach the gospel, um, at least for me, uh, I'm asking here, what, what are the thoughts that come to your mind? How do we do that? Uh, these sections give us examples of again, people that have this desire. Um, they go directly to the prophet. You know, at this time, uh, the church is very small and they're able to do that. Um, and they go to the prophet to, to seek guidance and direction and, and how that can be done. Um, but there's, uh, you know, so when we think of the actual title of these lessons, which um, in, in the standard gospel study guide, it's, I believe the subtitle is, You Are Called to Preach My Gospel. What I find interesting is, you know, I'm currently serving in the young men's and the teacher's corn. And in the lesson manual, which is essentially the same thing, it just has a different picture and a different title. Uh, it's how can I invite all to come unto Christ? And, uh, and again, that's kind of what I want to focus on with these, these sections. Um, that is our, our charge, is to invite others to come to, unto Christ. When I think of the prior title, or you, know, uh, you are called to preach uh, my gospel, I think of the much more formal aspect of uh, missionary work. I think of serving a mission or, you know, something along those lines, right, which is, at least in my mind, gets fixed in a specific time, right, and has a beginning and end and all that, whereas the, the other title of the lesson, right, uh, how can I invite all to come into Christ, that, that never ends, and so that's one of the two premises that I, that I have with this, uh, that I want to put forward in, in our time together today, um, that is that we never stop inviting all to come unto Christ, that if we look at the preaching of the gospel, the sharing of the gospel in that way, it, 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 it encompasses everything that we do, everything in our life uh, as Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ, whether we receive a calling to do something specific or not, um, that is our charge. That's the covenant that we make uh, in following Christ. Uh, the other premise that I have that kind of cycled over it a couple of times is just that Preaching and inviting, in, in my mind, are essentially the, the same thing. Um, inviting others to come to Christ can in, involve many different things. Um, and it involves definitely having relationships and uh, building friendships um, and sharing the gospel or inviting others to come to Christ is something that just happens. It's not something that's mechanistic. It's not something we're pressured to do. When we have genuine relationships with people, friendships, um, we just, you know, we, that's something that comes up. We share our lives with people. I was touched um, recently. I'm in, in the Grandview State. I think that's the name of our state. <laughs> I know it's on Grandview. I just can't remember if there's a South State or not, but maybe it's South State. But anyways, um, 
I'm up on Grandview Hill in Provo, and we recently had missionaries uh, in our testimony meeting. And they, um, one of them, as he was sharing his testimony, it struck me because as he was he was discussing those that they were teaching, he didn't use the word investigators, which I loved. He used the word friends, uh, and and to me that's that that's just again really crystallizes what's been my approach to how I how I think about my relationships and, and when the gospel comes up and, and what is my responsibility as a Christian was my responsibility uh, and, and my callings in regards to the church and my, my duties in those way. Uh, it, it's coming out of a love, a love for people and, and, and friendship. Uh, if I can start with a very personal, uh, before we get to the section, real quick, a very personal example of um, someone that, that really helped me to see these things because uh, many in many of the sections that we read and many of the stories, if, uh, I definitely point you towards the um, the uh, my mind slipping right now. The revelations in context. These are wonderful essays that provide background and context, and I'll be drawing from them for some of these stories. But as we read those, one thing that we realize is that you know, particularly the people that I'll be focused on today, Thomas B. Marsh, Ezra Thayer, Orson Pratt, those around them. Um, some of the first people that they shared the gospel with was their family. It was their friends. You know, they, so they received, you know, some of them received a call to go and, and preach to, you know, the Lamanites, right, uh, at that time understood as Native Americans in Indian territory. Um, but a lot of them, some of the first people that they shared the gospel with was those that were immediately around them. And I have to imagine that that comes out of love. Uh, so uh, also on our panel today is uh, my sister, Cadiz uh, Silvestro who I have to you know, acknowledge and thank because she did that to me. I'm going to ask her to unmute because I'm going to ask her if she remembers. So this is us going back in time quite a bit. But uh, she did, when she chose to serve a mission, she received her mission call. At that time, she was living in New York. Um, she came home to visit. And I let her in on a little secret about uh, my plans. Do you remember what that secret was? Yeah, I remember. Um, you told me that you were very happy I was going to go on a mission because your plan was that you were not going to go, and that uh, that way Dad wouldn't feel so so much of a failure when you uh, let him in on uh, your plan because you could you could say, "Well, look, you already got your oldest going, so you're all set, Dad. You did a good job." I think that's what you're alluding to. That's exactly what I'm alluding to. Yes, uh, Cadiz will share a little bit more about our family and particularly my father's conversion uh, a little bit later on. But my parents were both converts and my dad later on. And so I was raised pretty much in, in, in the church and I was raised to, to go on a mission. And, um, you know, I decided at that time that, that, I, that I wasn't going to go. Uh, and what did you do about that, Cadiz? Um, I put you on the altar of my heart. <laughs> Sorry. But you can see we're an emotional family. We all wear our uh, hearts on our sleeves. And every day in the mission, I put you on the altar of my heart and just prayed that um, you would come to understand and come to see the Lord's love for you. And you'd have that desire. And if I ever felt the uh, inkling to be lazy, I thought of you. And I thought, nope, I, I need, I need, I need the Lord to bless my brother. So put you on the altar of my heart and went to work. And I'll tell you, it worked, people. I didn't know this. Um, I think this was unbeknownst to me. And of course, she wasn't the only one, um, you know, praying. And I wasn't a terrible person. <laughs> I was just a kid, you know, um, a kid having doubts. And, and what those prayers did is they actually brought missionaries to our home. Uh, our family was, you know, we went to church and everything. Um, but uh, several wonderful uh, young men uh, came to our home and, and they befriended me. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know exactly, um, two of them are my brother-in-laws now, <laughs> but I don't know exactly, uh, what their intention was when they came over or how they, they came over, who's, who sent them, if anyone sent them or anything, but I want to reemphasize it was, it was love. It was love of a sister, um, praying and, and fasting, uh, for me. Uh, it was the love of missionaries that just befriended me. And that's all I needed. I needed someone to befriend me, to show me that um, being a missionary could be fun, you know, that people like me would do something like that. And, and those things forever changed my life. 
So let's let's look at a few examples, um, if we will. Uh, if we can, let me share my screen. <clears throat> I want to start with uh, where did Thomas B. Marsh go? Thomas B. Marsh. Uh, those that uh, and I should have. I had planned to pull up a picture of Thomas B. Marsh. So sorry. Sorry about this. There we go. Here's some images. So we may be familiar with Thomas B. Marsh, um, mostly maybe because of his experience in the church is maybe a very cautionary tale. Uh, he had a, a dramatic rise and he had a dramatic fall. Um, and the fall, I guess, will be discussed in a later lesson. And what I want to focus on today is, is really his conversion uh, and, um, and his call. Uh, so Thomas uh, Marsh, let me get my notes back up. But uh, Thomas B. Marsh was born in 1799. Here we go, go back here. And uh, at the age of 14, he essentially ran away from home, which I'm just trying to imagine uh, what, what led him to do that, I don't know. Um, we don't know too much, at least that the essay doesn't go into too much detail about how that happens. Um, and and while, after he runs away from home or he leaves home, he essentially travels around. He's you know, kind of a vagabond of sorts. He, he works in, uh, as a domestic uh, uh, laborer. He works in a hotel. He works as a, as a waiter. He works in a, a typeset foundry, uh, mostly in, around New Hampshire, Massachusetts. And eventually, he comes to settle down in Boston. Um, and at about the age of 29, he is married. He has three children, I believe, all under the age of, of nine. And he gets this impression, and that's this highlight here, here in 1829, Marsh believed the spirit of God dictated me to make a journey west. And he does this with a friend. And I'm just trying to imagine how strong this impression had to be. Because he's a father, he's a husband, I'm sure his, his life where he has traveled around quite a bit and trying to get settled and, and um, you know, have some type of, I imagine, consistency in his life, um, you know, in regards to providing for himself. This is, this is quite a drastic decision, it seems to me. And I can only imagine that he received this prompting probably several times and, and, and finally what got to the point to where he just couldn't ignore it. I can only imagine the types of conversations he had to have, he must have had with his, his wife, who permits him in some way, I mean, allows him to do this. I, I mean, I, I couldn't imagine being gone for months. Uh, every time I, I have to leave on a conference, um, which I haven't done lately, but um, prior to the pandemic, it was quite like a big deal in our household. You know, it's, it's hard to be away uh, from children and, and loved ones for uh, a few days, nonetheless, several months. But he they come to this decision and, and God bless her for supporting him in it, right? And he makes a journey out West and he runs upon you know, uh, another woman. Uh, not many women are noted uh, or mentioned in, in the Doctrine and Covenants, I should point out, only three revelations are dictated or, or given towards women. But I love the fact that this, the revelations in context are giving, a better, giving, a better dip, uh, uh, giving us a better, more fuller picture of, of how important these women are in his life because this, Another woman, I don't know whether she was a convert or not, but she essentially um, asks if he's heard right here of, of a golden book and tells him about Joseph Smith. And so this leads him to Paul Myra. And then Paul Myra, he just, you know, he meets, you know, he meets the, the big three essentially, or, or several. Uh, he meets David Whitmer, or, or is it Martin Harris? Is he, is. he goes to E.B. Grennan's printing office, uh, right? He meets uh, Martin, Martin Harris, Rico, and um, and Oliver Cowdery, Joseph Smith is out of town uh, and uh, he's able to get 16 uh, pages, page proofs right, of the Book of Mormon. They're in the midst of printing the Book of Mormon uh, and uh, he takes these home and he shares them with his wife. They are converted. Um, I will point out, by the way, if, if you haven't had the opportunity to stand next to that printing press. That printing press is in the Church History Museum in Salt Lake City. And that is among one of the most powerful uh, spiritual experiences that I, I've had in my life. Um, you know, to me, standing next to that press was as good as holding the golden plates, you know. Um, 
So I definitely encourage anyone that can. Um, so it's an amazing experience to stand next to that press and realize what came off of it. So they're converted, right? And um, he maintains con uh, uh, in contact correspondence with um, uh, with Joseph Smith, a thought of a cowdery, and his parent, his family decides to just pick up and move to Palmyra, um, and uh, they do that. And so he goes to Palmyra, and it's there where he is baptized by David Whitmer. He is ordained as an elder in Oliver Cowdery, and uh, his kind of amazing meteoric rise in, in the church, you know, begins there. Um, like many of these, uh, in many of these sections, shortly after these people are baptized, uh, they go to the, the prophet and they're seeking guidance, right? And so I, I want to pause right here and, and see if we can get some comments or, or uh, from uh, those that are viewing. Uh, I, I was thought of, you know, that's, this is the way that they could, they could kind of seek more wisdom on what they should do. They had, they had followed these promptings. Ezra Thayer does the same thing. He's an example here. Horse and Pratt, it's, it's all kind of a similar thing, right? They, they get baptized, they move, they pick up and move. And uh, it seems like they follow the, the promptings of the spirit. And then they, they get to um, Palmyra or New York with, with their, they're uniting with the saints. And then their, the next question is, well, what, what do I do now? And so my question is, how do we get that direction today? Um, and there's no particularly right or wrong answer. I'm just trying to collect some thoughts here on uh, when we have those type of inclinations, um, we're seeking further guidance, right? Even beyond what we can get ourselves, our own personal inspiration. Where do we go for that? Um, just to bring in <clears throat> other comments. Oh, sorry. I don't know if someone else. Um, but someone had mentioned a while ago, they said, before teaching, we're required to learn the gospel first. For all things will be brought to our remembrance in the very hour of what to say by the spirit. Um, and that I think that goes pretty close to your question, right? Where um, first we have to think out in our mind. We, you know, when we when we're seeking answers, we're we're asked to to do some work first, right? We need to um, be able to decipher first. If if we don't know where we're kind of starting from, then we can't. There's nothing for us to choose from, right? And so I think that's one of the first steps to to figuring out where in what direction we should go. Wonderful. Any other thoughts? Maybe even along the lines of, is there someone that we can approach, you know, in the church uh, to maybe gain that guidance in a similar way that these saints are doing it? I... I don't see comments here yet here. Um, I've also had these experiences. I was also told I would be for the members and to teach faith. Um, so I reference not, specifically to like Thomas Marsh, right? Who's, who's told he'll be, he's called to be a physician of the church, right? And I'm wondering, Cheryl, where, who told you this? Uh, where, did that, where did that come from? Is this a, something personal that came to you? Thank you. Okay, great. Right. From from the Lord. That's uh, I'm not sure everyone can see all the chat. So okay. that's Cheryl saying from the Lord. I have wondered because these are messages coming through Joseph Smith. Um, I've wondered whether people look for a a road of Damascus, a road to Damascus, a Saul to Paul kind of um, inescapable experience. And the, um, I suspect that experience is rare, that there, that the, that if it's, whether it's Joseph Smith or a still small voice or a, a, an inclination that it's, uh, for most of us, it's a small thing, a, uh, a nudge rather than an overwhelming uh, force. Uh, and I, I, I think we should at least think about, talk about that. Thank you, Chris. I, I completely agree. David Sandberg says, it is typically a road to Emmaus experience and leads mm -hmm. to unexpected results. Yeah. 
I, and I like how you pointed out there, Chris, that it, it can it can come through gentle promptings, uh, as also as Cheryl did. It can also come through uh, the counsel of others, uh, others in our households, um, others, you know, of, of our faith group, uh, maybe in our wards. Uh, you know, we have patriarchal blessings. We have kind of formal, you know, ways of getting guidance like that. We, uh, I'm, I'm reminded of. Um, where we lived before, prior to coming to Provo, there was a, a sister that, that that I was able to minister to, um, and it was uh, it was just her and her two daughters. She's a she was a single mother, and uh, she was a relatively recent um, convert to the to the church. She had joined the church, I think, within the, the prior ten years. But um, uh, you know, her dominant language was was, was Mandarin. Uh, she spoke English very well. Um, she she attended church. Um, but, you know, I think there is a, there is a lot that, you know, without having, you know, the, the, the cultural bringing up in the church that she didn't uh, realize that was available to her. And one of those things was one time when we were talking, uh, uh, you're talking, she was about talking about a new job and I had shared a lesson and talked about, you know, priesthood blessings and uh, things of that sort. And, and, and she didn't realize that that was open to her, that uh, requesting uh, those around her, um, priesthood holders in the church, or even just speaking with me uh, in, you know, in those moments where we could pray together, or we could seek advice together, you know, for what she should do to provide for her family, she was considering a new job, and, uh, and that that was open to her as well. Um, so, and, and the church creates wonderful opportunities uh, for us to be able to, again, build those type of relationships, um, and, and really love and serve each other in that way. Yeah, there's a couple of comments here. Um, developing whatever that feeling his sister had for him, um, uh, you know, not just for a sibling, but for others. Uh, we don't always know how to do that, but I suppose it starts with those in the household. Uh, and that really, um, you know, I was thinking about that experience too when you asked the question about, um, you know, your sister seeing this deep need and, uh, and then putting you on the altar of her heart and going to work. And I love that, that kind of that process, that thought of that process, right? Seeing the need, um, allowing that to touch your heart, be in your heart and then going to work. And I think that's um, often how that, how that happens, right? Allowing ourselves to see need and to be touched by that. Thank you for pointing that out, Rebecca, because uh, I just emphasize I wasn't asking for help, <laughs> you know, or maybe I was right. And I just didn't realize it. Maybe, you know, maybe the, the spirit was the thing that prompted me to admit this to my ex. I hadn't told anybody. I hadn't told anybody. This would be a big secret. I was, I, my great plan was to move out of the house because my dad was going to kill me. Right. <laughs> That's an exaggeration. My dad's a very loving person, but I knew how disappointed he would be. Right. Uh, but yeah, being, you know, in tune enough, right, to, to listen to the promptings that the Lord will give us to bless those around us. Definitely. Yeah, a, a, a valuable comment here. I shouldn't put adjectives to it, but a comment here. It's interesting that these are early records of what now would be like a blessing, like a, a yeah. setting apart um, the words of a patriarch or of a of a priesthood leader giving us a blessing. These are recorded because they're early and they show up as scripture, but we have those kinds of experiences when we are set apart and, uh, and given instruction and given advice in those blessings. I, that's a, I, 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 now here I am doing adjectives. I think that's a, a, important. I mean, this is, these are early church experiences, but, um, but if you translate them to 2021, they happen all the time. Um, yeah. It's not Joseph Smith, but it's, uh, it's happening. I, I, I have a different experience I would add in here. This is me personally, um, because sometimes I will think, oh, it's a patriarch speaking. It's my bishop speaking. Of course, he's going to say that. Um, I, had, I had two different experiences, one of them with a BYU professor, as a matter of fact, who, was, uh, who listened to me for an extended period of time and then came back with a thoughtful 
listening to you, thinking about what would be good for you, here's some advice. And, and those prefaced with listening to you um, became very powerful, very important. When, and what I'm touched by, you know, picking up on that, Chris, is, and, you know, I'm thinking here, here again is Thomas Marsh and it's, you know, Ezra Thayer and Orson Pratt. They all go to the prophet and I'm thinking about the tremendous faith they have. I'm thinking about the pressure he has. He has this kind of just revolving door of people coming in and out of his household. I mean, God bless Emma. My gosh. Um, I mean, they weren't even living in their own home. They didn't have their own home at this time. Um, uh, so I'm thinking about that, but I'm also thinking of how the Lord let, you know, these people seeking guidance know that he knew them. And, you know, for Thomas, uh, it was by, you know, telling him, uh, basically referring to his family, you know, referring to the trials he had had, maybe referring to his youth, um, whatever led him to have to leave home. Um, mentions here in verse two, behold, you have had many afflictions because of your family. Nevertheless, I will bless you and your family. Yea, your little ones. And the day cometh that they will believe and know the truth and be one with you in my church. Um, I, I have a very similar, a very similar type of wording in my own patriarchal blessing that refers specifically to my family, concerns about families, not about the trials, it's, but it's referencing things that I had thought about, not about just my existing family, my family at that time, which is my siblings and, and my parents who uh, I was very blessed to, and am still blessed to have with me, but also thinking a lot towards the future. And you know, my, my blessing put me at ease regarding so much of those things. And, and here's the Lord. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, I, I'm sure Joseph Smith learned some, several things about Thomas Marsh, but, uh, you know, there are early experiences in the Doctrine and Covenants right, with, with Oliver Cowdery, with, with, you know, Martin Harris, with several others, where the Lord begins the revelation by, by basically saying, I know you, and, and dropping a little tidbit by, by saying, I know this has been on your mind. And, um, you know, to let, let them know that, that uh, uh, what's coming because then what comes after this is this column right and it, it, it's 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 kind of it can be a pressure right so when we think of the things we're asked to do or, or just the pressure maybe there's pressure of the responsibility of being a christian of, of, of knowing that we should invite people that that can be a that can be a lot to carry sometimes um particularly when we're worrying about our temporal needs our families you know um again i, I can only imagine what these people are experiencing they're picking up stakes we're unexpectedly, you know, our family found out we have to, we have to move, we have to move soon. Um, we're staying, hopefully we're staying for a little bit. Uh, it's just our own circumstance. And I, I'm just reading these, these, these sections and, and understanding what they are doing and all that uncertainty has really struck me on how the Lord approaches them in these revelations to let them know that I know you, I love you. I'm going to ask you to do something that, that you probably don't think you can do, but you can do it. You know, and he promises them that they, that they can um, a transition to uh, Ezra Thayer, and I'll uh, really quickly. So, um, and, and also the, just to reemphasize that one of the things that Thomas Marsh is, is called to do, uh, he eventually becomes, you know, an apostle. He's one of the first apostles. He becomes, you know, the first president uh, of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, and um, you know, he's called to be a physician to the church. And and so much of the work that we do is it's not just again outside of the church. It's 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 our interactions with each other. Um, everything that we do uh, in the church, every calling uh, is us being a physician to each other, right? Trying to bring each other, help each other come into Christ. The, the second story here with, with Ezra, Ezra Thayer, a um, little bit big, different of a background. Uh, Ezra Thayer comes upon the gospel when he's older. He actually knows Joseph Smith. Uh, they had Joseph Smith and his father uh, and his brothers had, and Hiram, I believe, had worked for him. So when he hears uh, in the fall of 1830, that, um, you know, Joseph Smith, this, this boy and his family that has worked for him as essentially like wage, wage laborers, right, um, that he's like a prophet, he's publishing a book of scripture, right, Thayer's response is disbelief, right, <laughs> he's just like, no way, not this kid, not this family, I know them, right, and uh, what opens his heart uh, again, is, is, is his family members. His family members actually start to go and listen. 
Um, and uh, so he has this skepticism to him and, and it's really not until his older brother comes and basically almost forces him to go with him and says, look, you, you know the Smith family, how hard can it be just to go listen to them? Um, and so he does, you know, on one evening in, in October, they go, they travel, he, he listens to um, particularly Hiram Smith begin to preach, right? And it's described right here that as he listened to Hiram, right, his resistance melted away. He later wrote about this exp his experience that day. Every word touched me to the inmost soul. I thought every word was pointed to me. The tears rolled down my cheeks. I was very proud and stubborn. There were many who were there uh, who knew me. Uh, I sat until I recovered myself and did I look up. And then he shares how he, he buys a copy of the Book of Mormon because that's what you do at this time. They need, to they need to cover the cost of printing. And as he does this, Martin Harris, you know, who's standing by basically says, hey, yeah, you know, he, he probably bears his testimony to him as well. And what I love about this is that, you know, Ezra responds and says, I already know it's true, right? He didn't even have to read it. And I'm sure he did read it, but that power of testimony, and that's something that we see is, is a recurring theme in, in a lot of these roots of revelations, that they are called to preach, they're called to lift their voice with the sound of a trump, right? And, and what is that supposed to be? They're not called to, not, many of these people, some of them are preachers, right? Like, uh, you know, Siggy Reagan who converts and, you know, he's a preacher, Oliver Cowdery, uh, et cetera. I mean, they have these type of backgrounds or Pratt, sorry. Uh, 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 they have these backgrounds where they were preachers themselves, but many of them, you know, didn't. And, but what are they called to do? They're called to go and just share with people what they know to be true, what they, what they share. And, and I'm gonna ask my sister to unmute again, Cadiz, will you unmute? And because as I read this story, just the aspect of, of going from skeptic to, to really faithful believer, reminded me a little bit of my father uh, in, in his story. I was very young when my father, uh, again, joined the church. I was like a year old, I believe. But my older sister and wiser sister, uh, Cadiz, was roughly five, six years old or so. And so she, she remembers this well. Can you tell us a little bit about um, dad's conversion? Yes, thank you, DJ, for uh, inviting me to share in this um, moment and in, uh, in your lesson. Um, so my father very much um, was, I feel, a, a general believer in, in God and that kind of goodness, but my father was very much opposed to any sort of organized religion. Um, he had not had very positive experiences in his own organized religion growing up, and he did not believe that God's power was to be found on the earth um, and that those who claimed to be priests or uh, pastors, that, that that was something they had taken upon themselves, that that, uh, that they were not um, here to act for God. Um, so my mother had converted to the church around 12 and um, grew up through high school. Um, and then when she went to college, uh, she was not really active anymore um, for quite a, for a period of time. Um, and a period of time where she was pretty much a do not contact. Um, when uh, DJ, my brother, and his twin Laol were around six months old is when my mother uh, in her heart felt that it was time for her to go back to church. Um, so she, at this point, told my father that she wanted to go to church. My father uh, was a little surprised because he said, well, I thought we had agreed. He assumed that she was Catholic. And he says, I thought we agreed we were not gonna raise our children Catholic. And that's when she said, oh yeah, I'm, I'm not Catholic. <laughs> um, and uh, he was skeptical, but he was very supportive. Um, he said, well, I'm happy, you know, I'll take care of the kids. You wanna go to church, whatever you wanna do. But he wasn't interested in, in going, but so my mother began attending uh, very quickly um her uh home teacher from her childhood um and uh, a visiting teacher that had been in the home very quickly uh, renewed their relationships with with my uh, my mother and um her home teacher uh named jedediah ashton he actually had driven her to seminary for four years um when she was a youth he was a very committed um, and loving home teacher was very happy to be in contact with my mother um, very soon made a visit to the home, explaining to my father what it was a home teacher was, um, and so that he would be visiting the home frequently, not monthly, but frequently. He'd be frequently there, um, 
And he was frequently there, whether it was to bring a message, whether it was, oh, look, I picked all these oranges and lemons off my tree. Oh, my wife made some extra bread. He was there, my mom said, almost weekly. Um, he actually blessed David James and my sister, Laol. He gave them their blessings when they were um, babies and gave them a name and a blessing. Um, my father at that time wasn't ready to come and um, visit, come to the church, but was fine with, oh, great, sure, you take them, get them blessed, that's great. Um, and so with these frequent visits, um, Brother Ashton showed love. And you know, I just want to preface this, not everyone is at the time of life or in the situation of Brother Jedediah Ashton. He was elderly, but with a lot of vigor and retired. Um, so he had a lot, a lot of time. So I'm, I'm not, uh, when I, as I share this experience, I hope people can understand that we, you know, this was very unusual and that there is no expectation that, that people need to serve in this exact same way because of their own family circumstances, lives, jobs, obligations. But, um, so my father at first would hang back, stay in a different room. Um, uh, but it was about six months and then suddenly Brother Ashton would come and my father decided he was going to come to the living room and, uh, and listen in. Um, Brother Ashton noticed that we didn't have a garden and asked my mother if she was interested in, in him coming and helping her put in a garden. Brother Ashton came over and put in a garden. Uh, he knew that my father was preparing to paint our house. We lived in a old Tudor house with a very high pitched roof. Brother Ashton would not allow my father to climb the ladder um, to reach this high pitched roof in the trim because he said that, well, he was already, he'd already raised his kids. And if he fell off the ladder and died, well, so be it. But if my father were to fall off, then he'd have his wife and his, you know, at that point, I think there was four children or my mother was probably pregnant with the fourth by then, you know, and uh, he did not lead, need to leave his children childless. Uh, Brother Ashton learned that my father loved sports and loved to play softball and basketball. He invited my father to come and join the church softball league. Um, and slowly over time, my father just gained real comfort um, and ability to get to know the members of the church, to see their goodness. Um, now the Lord, uh, he also was working and my father had a um, very much a road to Emmaus experience, um, uh, visiting on a, on a random business trip with my grandfather doing land speculation in Utah, where they went to the Salt Lake Temple my dad thinking, oh, well, I can go to the temple and buy my wife a little, you know, Joseph Smith medallion that she can wear or something like that. Went to the temple, figured out, oh, no, you can't do that, but you can go to the visitor center. He had an amazing um, spiritual experience regarding um, the restoration of the gospel and priesthood power on the earth um, and how that was accessible to all. Um, and not just for certain people to take that upon themselves and exercise dominion over others. Um, so uh, my father was very much loved into a position of being open to receiving uh, the experience from the Lord. Um, this uh, brother Jedediah Ashton was like another grandfather to us. Um, he baptized my father. My father's a very large man and Jedediah Ashton was a very small and aged man. And uh, uh, that was fun watching that happening in the, in the baptismal font. Um, but my father didn't manage to take uh, Brother Ashton down with him. Brother Ashton was in the uh, temple ceiling room. When I remember coming through with my brothers and sisters, when uh, it was time for us to be sealed to our parents, and the very first person I saw was Brother Ashton. Um, and um, this last thing I want to share, I mean, uh, so Brother Ashton, he, he passed um, the night before I entered uh, the Provo, Utah Missionary Training Center to serve the mission, uh, I had a dream. And in my dream, I saw Brother Ashton. And he told me how proud he was of me. And uh, I really felt that that was a, a true message because this man had loved us in the flesh. He had loved us in life. And even though that he was gone, I couldn't see any reason why, why that love that he had expressed and shown for us, that concern, um, dedication, why that would go away um, through through death. Um, and I'm, I'm so grateful for the angel that the Lord sent to our family. 
um, I will praise Jedediah Ashton's name every day. Thank you, Cadiz. When you mentioned the word angel with him, I think truly that's what he was for our family. And I, I think of, uh, you know, at the end of Second Nephi, I was at 30 or 31, when, when Nephi's explaining that, that angels speak by the power of the Holy Ghost, right? Um, that's, in, that's indeed what, um, what Jedediah did. He, he listened, Brother Ashton, he listened to the Spirit. He followed the promptings. He was patient. He didn't have an agenda. He just loved. And um, uh, I mean, and his, his impact is tremendous. Uh, definitely. I, I, remember, I remember dad telling me about his conversion. He, he, I remember him saying he's walking up to the Christus statue, um, you know, in the Salt Lake Visitor Center. And when he, he saw the Christus, um, that's when it hit him, you know. And I, he, he, I, think he, I remember him telling me that he kind of almost, whether he heard a voice, he felt the words that said, if you don't believe this, you will never believe anything in your life. And um, those are and, exactly uh, dad's words. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, Amanda, I want to give you a, a turn too. I'll, I'd love to hear. I don't know how your family came into the gospel and I'd love to hear about how that happened. Would you mind sharing that with us? Yeah. Um, my mom and my dad actually have very similar stories. They're all um, in families of six children and their whole families got baptized. My dad, when he was uh, my my dad's family when he was nine and my mom's family when she was 18. Um, and the similar story is that their whole family stopped going to church at some time, all of their families together. And my dad uh, with his older brother, uh, my dad didn't have the best relationship with his dad. So his older brother was his parent. Um, and his older brother was the only one who stood in the church, his two older brothers. And they took him to church every day. And they were like, you need to come with us. Um, and it was the example of his brothers that allowed him to go to church and later to go on a mission and to marry my mom. And my mom was the only one that stood um, in the church for the longest time. And um, my mom would always tell me that my grandma was not, she didn't, she stopped liking the church at some point. Um, and my mom would tell me that she, my mom's the greatest daughter. She's the great example of a daughter. And she would have to clean everything, um, make sure the house was perfect. And she would make breakfast uh, for everyone in the family before she went to church, just so her mom would not be as mad when she came back to church, uh, from church. And it was, it was, it was really hard for her knowing that her whole family had at some point accepted the gospel and then not anymore. Um, and I just, and I was born in the church because of the example of my mom and my, and my dad, but I, I think they're pioneers to me because of their resilience. I, I always hear stories of the pioneers that walked in the snow and that did all of these things. And I never felt connected to them, but my mom, um, she made breakfast every single Sunday for her whole family. So her family wouldn't be mad at her for going to church. Um, and my dad, as a little kid, he listened to his brothers instead of maybe sisters or everyone else. Uh, he could have just clearly not gone to church anymore. And um, they're my little pioneers for us. And I'm, I'm really excited when, when I have kids being able to tell the stories of my own uh, Parley P. Pratt's and um, everyone around me. And um, yeah, so that's my family conversion story. <laughs> Thank you, Amanda. That was that was beautiful. Uh, and there's a comment in, in the, the chat that points to that. Um, Sandra says, I'm struck by the important role that both spiritual and biological siblings play in our conversion and strengthening our testimonies and helping us draw nearer to Christ. Um, and, and your comment about pioneers also, I think uh, that's so true. You know, uh, for, for us and our family as well, it's, um, you know, being us being raised in the church, my siblings and I, and my parents just you know, they did the best, you know, they could, and they had, they had good people around them. We had, we were in good wars and they, they pretty much did what people told them to do, right? Because they're trying to learn how to be good members of the church in that way, even if that meant not allowing me to drink Pepsi when the rest of my baseball team was drinking Pepsi. And I felt like that was like a cruel thing. Um, by the way, Pepsi was never a thing we couldn't drink, apparently. But anyways, um, when I refer to as pioneers, uh, you know, our pioneer, my dad's one of them. Uh, the other one is my, uh, my grandmother. Um, 
uh, Dolores uh, Hines, and uh, she. It's a it's a story for another time, but but uh, when we when we think of our pioneers, those are the people that we think of, and and all of us have that. We have our family members, uh, you know, and or or maybe you know if you're the first in your family, um, you know, you you can look to someone else, right? Someone else is maybe a pioneer is a person that 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 shares the gospel with you, right? And and they're motivated by love. Um, since you mentioned siblings, real quickly, I do want to actually bring in uh, again Orson Pratt because I know we're we're running shorter on time. And, and that's how Orson Pratt comes into the gospel, right? Harley P. Pratt is his brother. Um, and Orson Pratt uh, has this experience that's very similar, I think, to Joseph Smith kind of in some ways, right? Where their family is so poor uh, that they have to hire him out. I mean, again, this, I know this is not an entirely uncommon thing in that period, um, but I'm still struck by uh, how difficult that would have been and, and so Orson pretty much being on his own had spiritual, you know, inklings and, and had questions in his heart. And, um, you know, his brother eventually comes into the gospel with it. It's partly, it's partly that when he, when Orson is around the age of 19, that, uh, you know, comes to him and, and preaches the gospel to him. And, and Orson had been prepared, you know, all that time. And, and he joins the church and he's, his, his, I think his section is, again, can speak to those of us right when, Regardless of how long you know we've 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 been a Christian or if we're following Christ, right? When we're we're asked to do something or we feel we need to do something and we don't feel ready. I, I, I love Orson's story because he's so young and he's called on a mission and he has all these self doubts about himself. Uh, but again, you know, the Lord tells him, I, "I know you. I've been preparing you for this. You can do this." Right? And so both that connection of family and uh, family love and bringing him to the gospel as well as the Lord assuring him that, you know, all those trials, all those struggles, you know, that Orson went through, that Thomas B. Marsh went through, Ezra Thayer's journey, we have so many examples. We have, uh, again, wonderful examples of, of Emma Smith. I mean, I just wish, um, you know, I know there's been some wonderful work done on, on Emma Smith, but, uh, uh, you know, Lucy Matt Smith kept a, a phenomenal journal. We, we know so much due to her uh, about her, her son and, and Joseph Smith during this period. I kind of wish we had something similar for Emma. Maybe there is, and I just don't know. I'm, I'm not a gospel scholar, people. You, you heard my background earlier. So <laughs> if it's there, I admit I'm ignorant. Um, but, um, but yes, um, are there any other thoughts from the panel? Um, yeah, I just... Um... Thank you so much for sharing these stories. It's been really um, moving. And I'm just so struck by, you know, Thomas Marsh talks about how the spirit of God dictated to me to make a journey and hearing about um, Brother Ashton and some of these others who, who make a journey, right, with your families. Um, and and it, I'm also thinking about seeing DJ's Black Lives Matter in the background and Brian Stevenson's. Um, you know, idea of, of getting proximate and proximity really making a difference uh, and that that's what really happens, right? Um, is that Brother Ashton is willing to be proximate and to get in there and to put in a garden with your family. And I love that as both a literal and a metaphorical uh, reference to the work that goes in um, to, uh, to that, to sharing the gospel, um, sharing the love of Christ. You're muted, Chris. I'm not sure if you're talking to us, but. I'm muted. Um, and, and thank you. Somebody pointed out that I should turn up my microphone and, and thank you for that. It turns out I had it turned backwards. There is a direction to microphones. Um, <laughs> I'm surprised that how I'm affected by these, your comments today, DJ and, and Cadiz and, and all I expected to be hearing about about Joseph Smith in these sections, and my mind keeps going to um, my siblings and my uncles, um, who we talk about. We talk about a hierarchy. Uh, 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 I mean, a lot of genealogy is 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 very directional, very up and down. Um, family tree sort of directional, but I 
have had so much influence in my life from sort of sideways relationships I'm thinking of uncles and siblings and, and um, I'm surprised. I didn't expect that out of today's lesson. I just I'm no I'm muted. Go ahead, Amanda. Just one more comment is I really like the comment that was just in the chat that it's are we not all pioneers in our work to translate the meaning of the restoration in our day? Um, I'm really happy that I in my opinion, of course, my uncles and my parents were my pioneers, but I feel like I have been able to translate the meaning of being a woman in the church and what the uh, priesthood means to me in my day. And um, I'm really excited for the way my children are going to translate the meaning of missionary work and how do they need to preach to um, minority and ethnic communities and um, other types of communities that it's a completely new understanding of the restoration of the gospel that as um, young people were able to have in our time. And I'm really excited have, of the way um, Professor Gabriel gave a talk on healing racism through Jesus Christ and of the way we, um, as we get understanding and education of these topics um, and as we become scholars or academics on these things, we're able to translate the restoration for even more people and for people that were always maybe ostracized and of the gospel and of the restoration and letting them know that it is for them and for their situation and Jesus Christ is healing their wounds. Um, so yeah. Amanda is a pioneer in more ways than she probably recognizes. Uh, at BYU, she is an incredibly valuable student leader. Um, she's helped uh, to run our, uh, she's led the, our, our student group Hispanos Unidos, which has been a group that was formed uh, I have students at BYU uh, shortly after I, I came and I've been able to, to witness its, its formation and, and the wonderful student leadership that has gathered around. The whole purpose of that group is to build community uh, for Hispanic and Latino students, uh, as well as those that want to be in community with them uh, uh, on campus. And so Amanda, you have done yeah, and continue to do amazing work. Um, it, it makes me think of a realization that I had um, not too long ago. Um, when I was in, again in South Pasadena, um, the ward there, uh, I was I was called to be the, the elders point president, and it was shortly after that call. I, I mean, I was in the middle of a graduate program, a PhD program, um, and you know, I know it wasn't the end of the world or the, the most the heaviest of calling, but I felt like the weight of the world was kind of on me. You know, I had four children <laughs> that. Uh, uh, my wife and I are, are raising in the midst of graduate school, and uh, we had already rebuilt our lives after we're in the process of rebuilding our lives after the 2007 to, to 09 recession that devastated us. Uh, I was formerly a, a mortgage a banker. Uh, my sister's husband, my best friend, is my business partner in that, and we both had to completely rebuild our lives. So uh, after that, um, and my path led me to graduate school. And uh, but the point is, I, I get this calling, and I'm struggling, you know, as I'm commuting to and from work. I mean, to, to school in downtown Los Angeles, which is where USC is near. That's where I did my PhD, and I just didn't see how I had the time uh, to 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 minister in the way that I needed to minister. And I felt like I was just such a failure. Um, but I remember getting the impression, and, and I was, you know, I was obviously. It was a very challenging program in time in my life. So I was reading my scriptures a lot. I was trying to do those things we're supposed to do, right? And the distinct impression came to me, and this is the point that I want to make here, is that there's only so much that I, it, was, I, it basically told me that I had reached pretty much the limit that I could get in drawing closer to God by just reading my scriptures and praying. You know, that I could do all that. I could go to church. I could go to the temple and, and all that stuff. I could do that individual stuff. I could try to fulfill my individual co you know, uh, covenants in that way. But if I wasn't going to serve and love, uh, then my, you know, my spiritual progression was capped. You know, that I was limiting myself. Um, and uh, that, was, that was an answer to me. I only, I only just share that not to impose it upon anyone, but just to, to say that that's when I realized and, and the door was open for so many opportunities for me to meet people um, and, and be able to serve them. Uh, that, that I just, I had no experience. I was still, I mean, even in my, my 
my mid thirties. I had, I had no, I didn't have the experience to counsel the people that, that I was put in contact with. I became friends with and loved them. And, um, but just that simple desire to love was, was the way forward. So, um, so I'll share that. And I know that we're, we're running, we're short on time. Right now. And are we at the end? I, I think that was a wonderful place to, uh, to end with your comment, DJ. Um, that, uh, and, and with that then, let's, uh, let's enjoy a closing song. Um, we'll hear uh, from Junior Miley, uh, because I have been given much. And then closing prayer will be Cadiz uh, Gonzalez Silvestro, whom we have come to know. Um, I have an introduction here. Uh, she's a 2002 BYU graduate in Spanish and family history. She's a family historian and an MA candidate in history at Harvard Extension. Um, but by today's stories, um, important to all of us. Thank you. Our dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the opportunity that we have to come together as a diverse online community from all over to build and strengthen our love for thee and thy son, Jesus Christ. We are grateful for the opportunity to love, to include, to share our spiritual and a spiritual fire as well as the the fire of our hearth with those around us we pray that we can be pioneers ourselves and making sure that our our wards and our stakes are loving places of inclusion where people can come and bring their authentic selves and be cherished and treasured and know that they have a place and we value them and value their voice Please bless us that we will have thy spirit to be with us. Uh, that we can reach out to those around us that despite uh, the continued pandemic and uh, the obstacles because of it, that we will find ways to reach out, to show love and to build one another. We can be physicians in, in the church um, to bring thy son's healing power into our lives and the lives of others. And we say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.